Last week we looked at the last in our series of messages on God's name, Jehovah Ra'ah, the Lord, our shepherd, and we talked about how he cares for us, protects us, leads, and guides his people, that is to say, his sheep. Now, we talked about this last week, but the Lord could have compared his people to any animal in the world, uh, to a strong, powerful bears, courageous, fearless lions, shrewd, wise fox, peaceful, meek doves, but no, he calls us sheep. And as we discovered last week, not exactly a compliment. Sheep are not so smart. As we learn, well, let's just say it. I mean, I said it last week with all your friends and family here that you invited to this wonderful, loving church. Come hear our wonderful pastor. And to show you I'm not very smart, I said sheep are dumb, defenseless, and directionless. So I'm, I'm a sheep too. Sheep require endless and meticulous care, more so than any other class of livestock prone to wander, defenseless, and simply not real smart. Sheep require someone who will look after even their smallest needs. Yet, sheep, despite all of this, and all of that's true, despite this, they become familiar familiar with the voice of the shepherd. They know his presence. And he knows his sheep. And there is this special bond between sheep and shepherd that's not found amongst any other type of livestock. It's a special relationship. And so understanding this, it makes us realize that it's not such a bad thing after all to be called a sheep. And Psalm 23 gives us a glimpse into this special, unique bond that we, his sheep, have with him, the Lord, our shepherd. So let's look at the blessings that we glean from this psalm uh, today as we think about the shepherd and his sheep. I want you to notice in verse 1, David is writing in the first person. He uses the personal possessive pronoun, my, to describe his relationship to the shepherd. He did not say the Lord is a shepherd, or the Lord is our shepherd, or the Lord is your shepherd. Rather, he says the Lord is my shepherd. So this speaks of an intimate, personal relationship that David had with the Lord. Can you say amen? As a result of this personal relationship, David is very confident that the shepherd, who, by the way, is is all-powerful, all-knowing, always present. He's the almighty God. That the shepherd will take care of all of his needs, for he goes on to say in verse 1, I shall not want Or as some translations have it, and the the meaning here is, I shall not lack. It means that we shall not be deficient, his sheep, not deficient nor lacking in proper care. Now, I don't know if that uh, registers with you because we, again, we've become so familiar with the 23rd Psalm. So I'm going to say it again. David's saying, That if the Lord is our shepherd, we're not going to lack, be deficient, lacking proper care. It means that he's going to take care of us, his sheep. Can you say amen? In other words, we have everything we need physically, materially, and spiritually. None of Christ's sheep lack anything in this world that is good, needful, and useful for them. Sheep do not feed, clothe, and protect themselves. They are fed, clothed, and protected by their shepherd. The shepherd takes care of his sheep. 
Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 27, he said to, to, his, to, to the people, he said, consider the lilies, how they grow and they toil not. They spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And so he goes on to say, if then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow was cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? From this we can confidently say that our shepherd doesn't want us to live in fear of lack. You hear that? He doesn't want us to live in fear of lack. We will always have what we need. Come on now, you're not saying amen too much here now. That's not to say we're going to always shop at Saks Fifth Avenue. Or we're going to go eat out at a five-star restaurant every day. No. What it does mean is that our shepherd will meet every need you and I have. Our needs, not our greeds. Can you say amen? amen. There's a difference. There's a big difference. So he's going to take care of us. Our needs, not necessarily our greeds. We never need to worry about our supply. You hear me? When we're in God's kingdom and God's army, you think Uncle, Ham's, uh, Uncle Sam supplies? God will supply everything you need. The shepherd, his eyes on the sparrow. So you can know this. He's watching over me. He's watching over you. No wonder David boasted. It's, it's almost like I, I picture in this 23rd Psalm. It's like, it's like David is in his fold. And, he, and he's got the Lord as his shepherd. He's looking over at other people. And he's like, he's saying, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Amen. Furthermore, not only do we not lack for physical, material needs, we're not going to lack anything spiritually that is good for us. Paul says in Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Everything we need, we find, we have in the shepherd. Amen. Now you're all going to have to catch up with me here. A Sunday school teacher asked her class if there was anyone who could quote the 23rd Psalm, and a little four-and-a-half-year-old girl said that she could, and the teacher, of course, was a little skeptical. And so the little girl came to the podium and bowed her head with a perky little smile, and she said, The Lord is my shepherd. What more shall I want? Well, she ran back to her seat, having not quoted it just right, but let me tell you something. Her theology was good. <laughs> if the Lord is my shepherd... What more could I want? What more could you want? If the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want anything, for in him I have everything I'll ever need. Can you say amen? amen. Praise God. Praise God. The rest of this psalm, uh, beginning in verse 2, is a development of this thought. As David tells us the things that the shepherd provides for his sheep. Because the Lord is our shepherd, and we shall not lack anything. Everybody with me? Say amen. Verse 2 says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. And you say, well, okay, pastor, you're not going to be very long this morning. Hold on. I'll try not to be too long, but this is some good stuff. It speaks of contentment. It speaks of a completely satisfied sheep. And I want you to notice the present tense. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He, 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 he keeps on making me to lie down in green pastures. It's not a one-time deal. He, he's continually making me to lie down. And it is the shepherd who causes this to happen. Hey, we don't lie down in our own power. And we need the shepherd to lie down speaks of rest and contentment. And boy, do we ever need contentment in this world we live in. I mean, Americans especially never seem to be content. 
And one would think with all of our material comforts and our high standard of living as compared to other uh, places in the world, we would be content, but it's not so. Our constant striving for more things. Oh, you guys ready for this? Our credit card living. Our insatiable lust for entertainment, sex, money, and on and on and on I could go is proof of our constant restlessness. Hear me. Even many of God's people are not content because they've not really gotten to know the shepherd through his word and through prayer. They don't really have the relationship that they need to have with him. They don't know the comfort of the leading and the guiding of his Holy Spirit, nor the glory of his presence that makes everything else in the world pale in comparison. It's it's why so many believers flock to therapists, self-help books, endeavoring to find answers to their problems, when all the while the Bible says that the shepherd has given us all things that pertain to life and to godliness. Listen, it's also the reason that false prophets and false doctrines are so prevalent. They, 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 know how to, they know how to appeal to the discontentment of God's people. And the antidote is knowing the shepherd through his word and through prayer. Listen, my friend, money will not make you content. Money will buy you a house, but it won't buy you a home. Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> what good's a house if you don't have a home? And money will buy you sex, but it won't buy you love. It'll buy you a doctor, but it won't buy you health. Jesus said these words. He said, a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things that he possesses. You're never going to, 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 to find contentment in things. I mean, there is something about greed. You just, there's just never enough. You get something and you just want more. You get a new car, you want a better car. You, do, you never have enough. Only the shepherd can make you to lie down. Oh, only the shepherd can bring peace and contentment to your life. You'll not find it anywhere else. The woman at the well is a great example of someone trying to find peace and contentment in her life, even though she had tried many times through relationships. She was trying to find something that would bring contentment. Jesus said in John 4, 18, For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast now is not thy husband. And Jesus told her this. He said, If you drink this water, he says, you're going to thirst again. But if you drink the water that I give you, He said, you'll never thirst again. Can I just tell you something right now this morning that's really important for us all to understand? Quit trying to find contentment in a relationship. I can tell you this. There's no man, there's no woman, there's no boy, there's no girl, there's no person that can give you contentment. You will not find contentment with others. Only will you find contentment when you find Jesus. And when you're content with Jesus, then you'll find contentment in your life. Jesus said, if you drink the water I give you, it'll be in you, a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. And you know what the woman said? She was a very smart woman. You know what she said? She says, give me this water. Oh, boy, you can preach there. Give me this water. Oh, my friend. You need the water he gives you. And once you experience the joy of knowing the shepherd, you'll, you, you're going to say with the psalmist in 34, chapter 34 and verse 8, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is he that trusteth in him. Amen. Philip Keller in his book, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, gives us great insight. Great information regarding sheep. And I'm going to refer to him several times. He says regarding lying down in green pastures, he says, It is significant that to be at rest, there must be a definite sense of freedom from fear, tension, aggravations, and hunger. If any of these four things are present, a sheep, will not lie down. It won't lie down if there's fear, tension, aggravation, and hunger. 
Now let's look at these four quickly this morning and apply them to our own lives. Perhaps we'll find the answer to why we have no contentment, no peace. You see, in every animal society, there is this established order of dominance. Many of you, maybe you farmed growing up, and maybe you do now. And we have several folks in our congregation who raise chickens, and, and, and they know this, that with chickens, for example, uh, there, there is this order of dominance. It's called the pecking order, right? And, and there's always one hen that rules the roost. I'm not talking about at your house. I'm talking about it. Your... With cattle? It's called the horning order. And among sheep, it's called the butting order. They butt heads. Not going to be hard to make application here, is it? You don't have to be a preacher to get figure this one out. A lot of folks are butting heads. And Christians are not immune. Huh? I'll refer to Keller again. He says, generally, an arrogant, cunning, and domineering old you will be boss of any bunch of sheep. She maintains her press position of prestige by budding and driving other ewes or lambs away from the best grazing or favorite bed grounds. Succeeding her in precise order, the other sheep all establish and maintain their exact position in the flock by using the same tactics of butting and thrusting at those below and around them. And so because of this rivalry uh, amongst the flock, there is tension, and there's, there, there's friction, and, and, and so the, the sheep will always be on their feet because they're, they're, they're always ready to stand up and defend their rights, right? Hmm? We... Who's that sound like? They cannot lie down and rest in contentment as long as there's this headbutting going on, all this tension and friction. The point is, there's going to be no contempt, there's no peace with all this. The struggle for status is unfortunately not just among sheep. It can be seen in most any business, sometimes in families, communities, schools, sports teams, or church. <clears throat> We've all heard the phrase, climbing the corporate ladder, you know, step on whomever we must to get to the top. We want prestige and position, status. You know what it is? It's pride. It's ego, and it's ugly. Sometimes it's as silly, and I mean silly, as being right. Some sheep, some of us, our desire to always be right, to always be smarter than someone else, causes us to have friction and tension and button heads. Listen, folks. I will gladly admit, I have no problem with this, you may be and probably are smarter than me. But God still says you're a sheep. So guess what? You're dumb and you're defenseless and you're directionless too. So how's that for your ego? All right. Some of us are so sheep-like that when someone buys a new car, we're jealous. Get a new house. We're jealous. Hmm? We, we get jealous. Have you ever known somebody to go out and get a new car just because someone else got one? Or a new truck? Oh, I got to get a new truck now. Well, you got a new truck. I'm going to get a new truck. All right? We call it keeping up with the Joneses. All right? And sadly, it paints a pretty accurate picture of not only the world's way, but the way of the church. Shouldn't be, but let me tell you, sheep butt heads. Sheep butt heads. And when this occurs, there will not be peace and contentment in the flock. Jesus said in Matthew 20, 16, so the last shall be first and the first last. And I just want to say, oh, how we need to learn and believe that. I'm going to say it again. Oh, how we need to learn 
and believe that. Jesus himself had to deal with this spirit of pride in his own disciples. And in Mark's gospel, we find James and John wanting status. One desired to be secretary of state and the other prime minister, basically. And Mark 10, 36 says, and he said unto them, Peter, I mean James and John, what would ye that I should do for you? And they said unto him, grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. <laughs> really? Jesus spent three and a half years trying to get this spirit out of his disciples. One time, one time he, he set a little child down in front of him. Matthew 18 says, it says this, and he, at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus saying, Who is the greatest? Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as a little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was continually trying to get them to understand it's not about your pride, your ego, your status, prestige. A spirit. The spirit of pride, of ego, manifests itself even the night before he'd be crucified. Think about that. The disciples were that night jockeying for position. Jockeying for position. Well, I want to be the associate pastor. I want to get a preach. I should be the one that sings all. I need to sing solo. Right? I, 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 right? And here it says in Luke 22, verse 24, And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. We're talking about at the Last Supper. So Jesus, one last time before he'll go to the cross, endeavors to teach them about status and greatness. And he gets up from where he is seated, gets a bowl of water, girds himself with a towel, and washes his disciples' feet. They're dirty feet. The king of glory, uh, the, the creator of all, kneels down and washes their feet. Now listen to what he says in John 13, 13. You call me master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then your Lord and master have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. The word happy. You know what that word means? It's a word that's used in, in the Beatitudes. When it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, and blessed are the meek, and so on and so forth. It's the same word used. It doesn't speak of, uh, you know, happy because of, you know, you want a million dollars. It, it speaks of a happiness that's from the inside. It's internal. Not based on what your circumstances are or outward things. Not based on their status in this world. Contentment and joy are experienced not when we butt heads, but when, rather when we learn to love one another, when we learn how to be a servant to one another, when we learn to wash one another's feet. Can you say amen? Then you'll find contentment. It's interesting that to note that the less aggressive sheep, they're called the bottom sheep, that they're the most contented, quiet, and restful of all the sheep. They're on the bottom. Go ahead and fight, y'all. I'm going to sleep. <laughs> and so it is with us. And 1 Timothy 6, 6 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain, if we'll ever learn. One last point covering this rivalry spirit, this ugly spirit. When the shepherd came into view, when they saw him, they might have been butting heads, but immediately when they saw him, they quit their fighting. If the church had more of the presence of God, come on now, more praying, more worshiping, more true worship, there would be a lot less fighting, a lot less headbutting. May the presence of the shepherd always be in our lives and in this church. Can you say amen? amen? Praise God. Praise God. 
Keller tells us that freedom from fear is also necessary. Freedom from fear. In order for a sheep to lie down, they cannot be fearful. He says, it's not generally known that sheep are so timid and easily panicked that even a stray jackrabbit suddenly bounding from behind a bush can stampede a whole flock. When one startled sheep runs in fright, a dozen others will bolt with it in blind fear, not waiting to see what frightened them. He continues, as long as there is even the slightest suspicion of danger from dogs, coyotes, cougars, bears, or other enemies, the sheep stand up ready to flee for their lives. They have little or no means of defense. They are helpless, feeble creatures whose only recourse is to run. I have one brother that told me last week after the first service, he said, he said, uh, he, he, he was around sheep a lot. And he said, sometimes when attacked, even though not hurt that badly, a sheep would die of fright. My wife, Joyce, is like that. She's a pretty sheep, but she's a fearful sheep. She's frightened easily, and if I walk into a room, I've learned over the years, i got to make some noise, something, whistle something, say something. Because if I don't, she gets startled, and I'm afraid she's going to have a heart attack one of these days. She's a jumpy sheep. When we like sheep, like Joyce, can't lie down and rest and be content while we're full of fear. It's impossible. Just think about it. When you're fearful, there's no peace. There's no contentment. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 18, Fear hath torment, and he that feareth is not made perfect in love. So when a believer lives in constant fear of sickness, money, the future, the devil, whatever, he or she cannot rest. But God's not given us the spirit of fear. Indeed, God says 81 times or so in the Scripture, fear not. And it's interesting to note that when, 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 when the sheep could see the shepherd, they would lie down without fear. All they had to do was see the shepherd. They felt safe in the shepherd's presence. They knew the shepherd loved them and that he was going to protect them. And there's a common theme here. There's a common theme. We need the presence of God. Yeah. Hear me now. We need... The presence of God. When we know that the shepherd is with us, there's no need to fear. Amen. Uh, the, he, he, here's what the shepherd said in his word. Here's what he said. He says, when you go, go preaching the gospel, he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll go with you. I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And when we're doing His will and we're being led and guided by His Spirit, I mean, he's, the shepherd's leading us. I'm going to tell you, you don't ever, ever need to fear when the shepherd is guiding your life. And, and listen to this, the word of the Lord in Jeremiah 1, 19, And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. He says this, For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. The Lord said through the prophet Isaiah in chapter 41, verse 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yeah, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. I could go on and on and on. When thou passest through the waters, I'll be with thee. I mean, he promises to be with us. And here's the point. Knowing the shepherd is with us, his presence will give us rest and contentment, even in the face of grave danger. Can you say amen? So sheep can't lie down. When they're butting heads, there'll be no contentment, no peace. They can't lie down when they're fearful. It's torment. Quickly, quickly, as with the case of the freedom of fear or tension within the flock, the freedom from aggravation or tor tor torment of parasites and insects is a must for contentment of sheep. Keller says sheep, especially in the summer, can be driven to absolute distraction by nasal flies, hot fly, bot flies, warble flies, and ticks. When tormented by these pests, it's literally impossible for them to lie down and rest. Instead, 
They're up on their feet, stamping their legs, shaking their heads, ready to rush off to the brush, a bush for relief from the pest. He further states, only the diligent care of the owner who keeps a constant lookout for these insects will prevent them from annoying his flock. A good shepherd will apply various types of insect repellents to his sheep. He will see that they are dipped to clear their fleeces of ticks. I don't know how many of you have ever... You ever I mean, I've, I've been around cows a little bit, and they just always are tail flopping back and forth like trying to get the flies or away from them. I, I mean, it's like, I don't know. if I'm on. I'm, I, every once in a while we get a fly in our house, and that thing bugs me. I mean, just flies around my face. Zzz, and just, I mean, it's, it's, it, I, it, I seem to attract that kind of thing, not only a literal fly, but I, I, I attract people that can bug me all the time, it seems. <laughs> You know, you ever have someone bug you? Come on now, am I the only one to have somebody bug me? Or a situation that bugs you? Yeah, we, we, we all have had that. We all face circumstances or even people who bug us. And always these tormenting problems or people will rob us of our peace. And as with sheep, the only solution is the shepherd's anointed touch. He applies the oil, which symbolizes the Holy Spirit. Only the Spirit can soothe and heal and bring relief from the torments of this life. Oh, I've experienced it, and I know. Jesus said, I'll not leave you comfortless. I'll send another comforter, and he'll bide with you forever. One of my good buddies preaching, one of my best, best friends in the, in the pastoral uh, uh, and, and as a, another pastor says this sometimes, and I've, I, I, I stole it from him. But he, he, he says, the presence of God is like Novocaine. He said, well, what in the world? He said, you know, when you go to a dentist and they, they shoot you up with Novocaine, Novocaine, he says, you can hear the drill drilling. You can hear it. And you can't feel it. He, he said it, and, it's, and I found it true in my life. When you're in the presence of God, it just doesn't bug you as much. When you get in God's presence and you're full of His Spirit, people don't bug you as much. Oh, they're still flying around. It doesn't bug you like it did. It's just amazing. So, 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 oh boy, you could, let me go, get me, finally. For sheep to lie down in peace and contentment. They must be free from hunger. This is clearly implied in the phrase, green pastures. The region where David wrote was the arid, dry climate of Palestine, and it made it difficult to find green pastures. And if you've ever been over there in that, the land of, uh, of Palestine, it's Israel, the nation, has done a great job, but it's just rocky and difficult. And so to provide green pastures for the sheep, the shepherd had to put forth a whole lot of time and a lot of labor. He would clear the rough, rocky land, tearing out the brush, the roots, and the stumps, and properly prepare the, 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 the soil for seeding. And after that, he would irrigate the wa with water and carefully keep the land. All of this was essential to the success of sheep. A hungry, ill-fed sheep is ever on its feet searching for food to satisfy its hunger, never content and cannot thrive. The same is true of us believers. And boy, you could preach a whole message on this. I won't. But our shepherd has provided all we need to be fed and spiritually satisfied. Jesus said in Luke 4, verse 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. The word of God, it's milk for babes and it's meat for men. And the problem is that many believers are living by bread alone. Which, you know what that means? It refers to the temporal things of life. Always trying to find it. And things, money, position, power, whatever the case, and temporal things can never satisfy the hunger down deep in the heart and soul of man. Nothing. 
There's a famine in the land today. It's a famine for the Word of God. Believers are starving, starving for the true Word of God, which leads to discontentment and restlessness. This is why people are ever up on their feet, running from one gimmick to the next, from one craze to the next. They are not being fed the true Word of God. That means they're not either reading it for themselves or they're listening to preachers who are not feeding them anything but junk food. Come on now. I told you I could preach here a while. I won't. It's not new. It's not a new problem. It was a problem in Ezekiel's day. God gave instructions uh, saying in Ezekiel 34 verse 2, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? Ye eat the fat, and ye clothe you with the wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. My friend, let me tell you, you will never know contentment, never know true rest until you learn to feast on God's Word. You will ever be up searching, looking. A hungry sheep does not lie down. Restless, discontent. The question I have for you this morning is, are you discontent? Are you up on your feet? Restless, searching, trying to find that which satisfies the soul? Are you getting the word? Are you being fed? Are you in the scripture yourself? Not, you'll be discontent. Are you fearful? Worried about life, you'll be on your feet. You'll never have this, you'll never have contentment. You'll be tormented. Is there somebody, someone, some situation that's bugging you? You'll only find contentment in the presence of the shepherd. Been butting heads with somebody? Go make it right. Go make it right. Two Christians, my God, and two Christians should not be butting heads. That's the way of the world. That's not the way of the child of God. Forgive. Make it right. Quit butting heads with people. Who cares who's right? I just want to be right with the shepherd. I'd rather have peace and contentment and rest than to say, bless God, I'm right. Than you. So, are you lying down in green pastures? Because if you're not, maybe we know why now.